Ladies and gentlemen, making his comedy debut for you this evening, please welcome to the stage Mr. Steve Harden. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. Uh, on behalf of Pete Storm and myself and the Wally Playhouse, we want to thank you very much for coming out on a cold evening, especially in packing out the Raleigh Playhouse, especially in light of the fact of all of the other cultural and entertainment opportunities that you guys had in Beckley, West Virginia this evening. We really want to thank you for coming and spending it with us. Hey, if, that, uh, if the guy sounded familiar there that uh, introduced himself, Yep, that was me. I knew I was just a warm-up act, but they didn't tell me about until about five minutes ago that I had to introduce myself. So I'm kind of curious if, if you guys wouldn't mind. Would you mind if we took a mulligan on that and I had a do-over? Would that be okay with you guys? I wanna I wanna give another shot at that. So I, I'm just gonna go backstage. Do me a favor and just, just act like you haven't seen me, okay? <laughs> straight to platinum. Please put your hands together and let's welcome to the stage Mr. Steve Hardin. I don't know about you guys. What do you think? That, that second one, that's a little bit better? Yeah. Is, that, is that better? Actually, that was going to be my theme music when I made it into the MMA as the ultimate fighter champion. But um, I uh, I could just always envision myself coming down that long, I don't know how many of you watch MMA, coming down that long corridor, I'd be in that silk robe, you know, my entourage around me and that music playing. And then I realized, you know what? I'm a lover, not a fighter. And my wife will tell you, I stink at loving and I'm worse at fighting. So I figured I better stick to the comedy gig. You know, it's kind of an odd age uh, to, to try to get a career like this started. But um, hey, before we get started, there's a couple of uh, items that I got to go over. I guess this falls on me as the warm up back. Just a few housekeeping items. First of all, this, this is a list that the theater gave me of all the topics that I cannot talk about this evening because of political correctness and we don't want to offend anyone. I really didn't get a chance to read over it that much. I did try to peruse it to uh, cover myself a little bit. Uh, the, ba the gist of it is, uh, this evening I can't uh, make fun of you unless you're a white, Christian, heterosexual male. The rest of you are safe. <laughs> and this, this is the list of things I can't talk about because my mom's in the audience. <laughs> hey, on a serious note, I am trying to kind of get this comedy thing off the ground. I'm gonna have a table out after the show. If you guys could do me a favor, if you wouldn't mind, I've got some CDs out there I'm gonna be selling. It would help me out tremendously. If you guys wouldn't mind buying these, it would help defray at least some of my costs. I got the best of the flock of seagulls. <laughs> Gordon Lightfoot's greatest hits. And, uh, oh, this is a good one. Frankie Goes to Hollywood's only hit. For you Frankie Goes to Hollywood fans, that's just a joke, relax. Uh, speaking of people in the audience, uh, my best buddy from junior high is in the audience tonight. His name's Jim. I call him Jimmy. He's probably uh, sweating bullets right now. He didn't know he was gonna be in the act. But uh, I gotta hold on to his friendship. He's the only guy that's known me that long and still likes me. But um, Jimmy told me the other day, he said, you know what, Steve? He said, I should get into the show for free. He said, I've heard all your material and you know what? He's right. He has. The reason being, I use Jimmy as a springboard for my comedy. I'll be driving down the road and have a new idea. I call him up and I say, I say, Jimmy, 
Is this funny? Can I use this in my show? The problem with that is that Jimmy laughs at anything and everything I say. He's not a real good barometer for my comedy. So if this stuff isn't funny this evening, we got one person to blame, Jimmy. You know, it is an odd age to try to launch a second career. I'm 52 years old. That's when I realized it might be a little easier to break into comedy than to become the UFC fighting champion. But uh, I got a feeling because, because of my age, I'm not old, but I'm not young. So I have a feeling that half the audience tonight is going to be going, what is he talking about? The other half is going to be going, what in the world is he talking about? <laughs> you know, uh, I grew up in West Virginia. My parents moved back to West Virginia when I was about four years old. I went to uh, Marshall University. I did graduate, by the way. I probably should mention that. I uh, heard a few hurt fans this evening. Uh, so I graduated from Marshall. I moved back to Beckley. I'm married to a girl from Beckley. So I certainly consider myself a Southern West Virginia native. And like many of you, most of you, probably you get tired of hearing the West Virginia jokes and all of the stereotypes about West Virginia. So I've been kind of on a little personal crusade to try to set the record straight on that. I tell people, dude, this is the 21st century. You can't use the H word. You can't call us hillbillies. That's offensive. We prefer the term Appalachian Americans. You know, I also tell people, we didn't all grow up in trailers. We didn't all drive Camaros around. And for heaven's sake, I didn't marry my first cousin. It's an interesting uh, story. Uh, one of my good friends did marry my first cousin. I mean, I was going to ask her out, but my Camaro was up on blocks in the trailer park at the time. So, I don't know how many of you might have grown up with that mechanically minded father like I did. Let me set the record straight. My dad is my hero. He can build or repair just about anything you can imagine. Let me give you an example of that. And this is a true story. Years ago, he got an idea that he was going to restore an old Buick. So over 12 years, he tore this car down from beginning to end, all by himself. He's taken that uh, car all over uh, most of America, and he's won national awards with it. Not only that, then he built the very garage that he stores the car in. You know, it's a good day at my household if I plug in a lamp and I don't blow the breaker. <laughs> But growing up with, uh, with a, a dad like that was a little bit challenging. I would come home from school and I'd be like, Mom and Dad, I need to buy a, a toy sword. I got the lead part in a play at school, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. My dad would chime in, buy a sword? Come out here in the garage, son, I'll build you a sword. That was my dad's answer to everything. Come out here in the garage, son. So sure enough, the next day, here I go, I'm nine years old. I'm dragging a 12 foot, 12 pound, 5 foot long Claymore sword to school. As soon as I get there, they send me home. My parents want to know why. I'm like, Dad, you sent me to school with a lethal weapon. <laughs> so Saturday morning rolls around, and I'm doing what every kid my age on Saturday morning in that era did. I'm watching Saturday morning cartoons. My dad comes in the house. He says, come out here to the garage, son. You might learn something. I said, Dad. I'm learning something right here. I'm learning whether Shaggy and Scooby are going to figure out this week's mystery. You know, looking back, that show really didn't leave a lot to the imagination if you think about it. It's the same old storyline. The guy they saw at the front of the show was the guy by the end of the show. They pulled the mask off of him and he always said the same thing. I would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been for you meddling kids. <laughs> Now, I don't know about you, but this didn't really look like a crackpot crew of crime fighters to me. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, and I'd like to think I could pull a thing or two over on them. I think we ought to send them over to South Korea and deal with Kim Jong-un. You know why? I'd love to hear that interview. I would have gotten away with it, had it not been for you pesky kids. That's exactly how Kim Jong-un sounds, by the way, in case you're wondering. It's also exactly why I don't do impressions of my show. <laughs> that was the greatest impression of the little rocket man I've ever heard, and everybody knows it. <laughs> so Saturday, I do go out in the garage, but I don't learn anything. The only thing I ever learned was how to hold the light, and I didn't do that right. Not like that, son. You're holding it in my eye. Just go back in the house which is where I wanted to be in the first place. 
But I didn't get back in time to figure out what that week's mystery was and if Shaggy and Scooby were able to figure it out. The good news for me, I did get back in time, however, to figure out just exactly what conjunction junction's function was. <laughs> you know, speaking of Saturday morning cartoons, here's another one on this side of things that really doesn't make a lot of sense to us as adults, the Roadrunner. I mean, that coyote chased that skinny bird all over the desert. I'm thinking, why in the world didn't he just call up Acme and order a bird? And you know they would have had it. I mean, any company that's got nine miles of railroad track and a rocket sled or a giant horseshoe magnet could have hooked him up with some frozen bird. You know that. But you know, if you think about it, Acme was the Amazon of, of that day. I mean, you could order anything and get it in any time. And it got me thinking, that's probably where Jeff Bezos got the idea for Amazon. Think about it. He's 54, I'm 52. We're probably watching the same Saturday morning cartoons. He gets the idea, he sees that. He thinks that's a good model. But you know, that's about where the parallels between me and Jeff Bezos end. I mean, Amazon's worth $130 billion. I'm doing stand-up comedy for you guys in Beckley, West Virginia this season. You know, my dad did instill in me the love of cars. I do love the old cars, especially the muscle car era, if you guys grew up with that. You know, and what did we have back then, guys? We had the Mustang Cobra and the Mach 1. You know, the, the uh, Barracuda and the Plymouth Fury. What do we have today? The Nissan Leaf. <laughs> the Murano. Really? It's got more on right in the name. I'm like, how did they come up with that name? Was El Stupido taken that day? I'm not sure. But you know my favorite? My favorite car is the Toyota Prius. How many here drive a Toyota? Let me rephrase that. How many of you here drive a Toyota Prius and are brave enough to tell the rest of us about it? My God, that's the ugliest car I think I've ever seen. You know, you got to love the liberals saving the planet for the rest of us. Which is not a bad thing, really, because my Ford F-250 gets about nine miles to the gallon on a good day. I need someone offsetting my carbon footprint. I don't want to feel guilty when that last polar bear dies up there in the Antarctic. You know, I saw a Prius one time. It's a true story. I saw a, Pri a Prius driving around with a personalized license plate. That's a joke in and of itself, but I'm not going there. I said, I'm Dave's. Ladies, if we find ourselves dating each other and you drive a Prius, do me a favor. Don't advertise that on a personalized license plate. It's not because I'm married and I'm afraid someone's going to figure out that I'm having an affair. I just don't want anybody to know I'm having an affair with somebody who drives a Prius. I got morals. I'll tell you, you can always tell a hippie by the car they drive, can't you? It's usually a Subaru Outback. See it all the way down the road, and uh, they've got so many bumper stickers over that back window, they can't even see to back up. You know, one of those stickers always says, uh, coexist. You know what the other one always says? Buy local. Yeah, they're driving a Japanese car telling me to buy local. You ever been in a hurry and try to fuel up your car up, play that 20 questions at the pump? Would you like a receipt? No. Would you like a car wash? No. Are you a member of our rewards program? No. Would you like to become a member of our rewards program? No, I, I'd like to get some gas. Have you got one on there that says, would you like to get gas? Coaches? So I can push yes on that, and we can move this ball on down the road. I'll tell you, the other thing about driving, I drive a lot with my job. I'm in sales. This is one thing you ever notice. You guys ever notice motorcycle drivers? They must be the coolest guys in the world. They'll be going down the road, one going one way, one the other. They always give anybody, give each other that cool motorcycle way. Sometimes the vet drivers give each other the vet way, or the Jeep drivers may give each other a Jeep way. Never see two guys in a minivan doing that, do you? <laughs> nope, they're hunkered down over that steering wheel, got their hat pulled down, their shades all praying. Nobody sees them going to Walmart. Here's another thing. I was on the turnpike the other day, saw that car up there in the left-hand lane, not getting over, going slow. I bet no one in this room knows where that car was from. Ohio! You got it, Ohio. But you know what really made that bad? They had a bumper sticker that said, what would Jesus do? Now, I'm not smart enough to claim to know what Jesus would do, 
But I'm going to venture a guess. I know what Jesus wouldn't do. He wouldn't hang out in that left-hand lane, make me pass him on the right-hand lane, and lose my religion in the process. I'll tell you another thing. Cars have gotten just way too advanced. My Ford Edge is a company vehicle. It's got that Ford Sync system. You guys probably have something like that in your Priuses. I don't know. But you talk to your car. It's artificial intelligence. You know, intelligence is a subjective term right there. Let me give you an example. My wife's name is Kim. I'm driving down the road. I'm like, tell my car, call Kim at home. My car says, call Tim Malone? I'm like, no, call Kim at home. Leave Kim alone? I'm like, no, call Kim at home. Call Kim a hoe? No, I forget about it. Calling Kim at home. 